a very warm welcome to all of you. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker today, Mr. Namit Verma. Namit Verma is a geopolitics and security analyst with decades of real time experiences. Yesterday, military staged a coup in Bangladesh. India has robust strategic relationship with Bangladesh. The regime change is likely to bring Islamist radical in power. Also, there are international actors involved in the drama that unfolded in Dhaka yesterday. We all ask this question. Why it just a result of student protest or regime change with bigger actors involved? To explore these issues, our CEO, Dr. Pandya, will interview Mr. Namit Verma. It's over to you, Abhinav. Thank you very much, Dr. Jain. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Namit Verma, for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Verma has joined us earlier also for one of our sessions on the intelligence uh, networking and the changing world order. Today, we are going to discuss a very, very interesting issue. Something happened in Bangladesh yesterday, not entirely unexpected, but yes, definitely shocking in many ways. Military stage to coup and uh, Sheikh Hasina is out of power. She has left the country. She was in India uh, as per the most recent uh, uh, news portals. Uh, she was in India yesterday and she is uh, Reportedly, she is moving out of India and not going to UK or seeking asylum in UK. But the question arises is that what are the deeper implications of what exactly happened in Bangladesh yesterday? Is it just some kind of a student protest which led to this shocking development or there is something much deeper and bigger? Certainly, what happened yesterday it has implications for India, for the global geopolitics, for South Asian geopolitics. We are going to discuss all these critical issues today with Mr. Namit Verma. I know Namit Verma sir for, for several months now, and uh, I've seen, I've interacted with him. His insights into all these details are very critical. You know, definitely, I can assure you that you know, he's a person with a very different kind of experience, something which you will not find in think tanks or universities or media experts. You know. uh, the issues which he is going to bring forth, the things and the facts which he is going to highlight, they are the, the, the issues which are discussed in very secret corridors of power. So welcome, uh, Mr. Namit Verma. My first question to you, sir, this military coup which you know, uh, happened in Bangladesh yesterday, you know, it has you know, completely changed the equation in South Asia. Uh, Modi government was having an excellent relationship with Hasina Sheikh. Asina government came back to power with a thumping majority and you know, uh, definitely we all know that uh, there were accusations of uh, uh, rigged elections in Bangladesh by some Western powers. So my first question is that how do you look at what happened in Bangladesh and particularly in terms of timing, etc. Uh, what's your take on this? Then I'll come to the other questions later. But in general, what's your first impression of what happened in Bangladesh? See, it's, uh... It is obviously more than what is uh, made out to be a student uprising. And uh, we have uh, information about secret talks between uh, the BNP Tariq and the Jamaat in London uh, in the weeks preceding this event. And uh, with uh, the American diplomatic circles. Also, you mentioned that some countries have mentioned that there was uh, rigging in the elections. The observers who were present, including the American observer, uh, gave a very gave a clean chit of a fair election having been conducted. It was a week thereafter that the State Department uh, in Washington raised the bogey of the unfair elections, not the American observer who was present on site. And the, uh, this and similar, like this is uh, what usually happens in uh, all these great power games. And what is happening in Bangladesh today is actually uh, a revival 50 years later of an earlier great power defeat that the Americans had suffered. But as uh, very often happens that when the Americans lose, then the media narrative glosses over a lot of it. 
today the the other great power involved is not the soviet union which uh, uh, which helped ensure that the american moves of 1971 did not uh, succeed and you have to re, uh, this is but but it is uh, what is happening now is almost as if the hiatus of 53 years from december 1971 and then december uh, suddenly we are jumping into july august uh, 2024 so uh, and you have to recall that in 71 when kissinger chose to ignore the blood telegrams from his own uh, State Department representative in Dhaka and condone the, the genocide or the gender side as it is now being called of 30 uh, lakh, uh, 3 million Bangladeshis, something which the American establishment has uh, never really admitted, but they did turn a blind eye to that. And all that, and you see, much of it was has not been reported. Much of what happened in seventy one has been lost in the uh, in the populist narratives, which uh, even in India have uh, have uh, generally held the media space. But now there are a lot of uh, documents coming up, uh, getting declassified over these fifty years, which give an exact. Um, let us say an exact view of what actually happened then and of the and of the war, especially the events leading to the movement of the Seventh Fleet and the British aircraft carrier Eagle and the others. Now all that and the politics inside the uh, the dissent inside the British cabinet, the American bamboozling of uh, of Britain to join their seventy one effort of how. The Pakistanis conveyed to the uh, American Consul General in Dhaka that they were willing to surrender, and uh, the Americans uh, did not communicate that to the government of India. They were the interlocutors, but they did not. But they held it back, and they tried to somehow, uh, even uh, possibly, have a interface, uh, an armed interface with the Indian Army and the uh, Enterprise Carrier Group. When they failed over for over 24 hours, only then did Kissinger allow India to be informed. So Kissinger is dead. But what happened yesterday is the ghost of Kissinger coming back, uh, you know, making a comeback because of the desperate circumstances of the American economy. And there is another key, there, there are two other key uh, developments which should be. Uh, factored in before we understand why the Americans were so desperate to play this, play out this game today. Of course, Sheikh Hasina did mention in uh, in uh, May about the about without naming them about their demands for an air base as a quid pro quo for uh, collaboration in the elections, which she turned down. And uh, so that is also connected with this carrier group. Uh, story, and there are two other recent instances which have led to this flashpoint. The first is uh, Saudi Arabia's refusal to renew the petrodollar agreement, which lapsed on the eighth of uh, June this year. And uh, the second is the Indian uh, initiative of deep sea uh, oil exploration and extraction in the Andamans. These two hurt the American economy and American imperialism is based essentially on dictating the way uh, the, the, the trading trends of the world. This has been disputed over the last 20 years, 30 years by China. Uh, first by the Japanese, but then they matched up Next by the Chinese. And uh, finally, now there seems to be a lot of opposition coming in, including MBS and the others. Uh, as everybody, uh, this whole BRICS con conglomerate which has emerged, and uh, even for that matter, China and its SEO axis, the Russians, everybody who is now dealing in 
accrued in non-dollar denominated terms. This is perhaps the single biggest uh, economic challenge to American monetary supremacy. And all these factors have perhaps forced their hand. I think uh, Begum uh, Sheikh Hasina miscalculated. She presumed wrongly that, uh, that the Americans wouldn't do anything before November 5th. Obviously, the, 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 the complex, the deep state complex behind cannot afford to take the risk of an adverse uh, electoral decision in, in January or in November. So they had to cast the die in such a manner that irrespective of what happens, a parallel of the NATO uh, expansion into uh, Ukraine is what they are trying now to build up in Bangladesh against India. I think uh, we'll take it up now as you have. Namaji, thank you very much for your insightful opening remarks on the subject. Well, I was going through the several TV debates yesterday and I found that uh, overwhelming number of Indian analysts, particularly the former generals, the diplomats, you know, they were single handedly uh, blaming Ch on China for this. You know, they're saying that it's China's hand behind these uh, uh, events in Bangladesh. But when I read the situation, I found the facts quite contrary, you know, the, the evidence quite contrary to such claims because uh, Sheikh Hasina went to China recently. They signed a number of agreements and Sheikh Hasina was navigating quite tactfully between China and India. And uh, it seems that she was taking care of Chinese interests, which were mostly commercial in nature. But at the same time, she was having major differences with the Americans. Recently in her visit to uh, US for the World Bank meeting, uh, it, it's uh, said that uh, no one from the Biden administration met her actually at the, many statements have come in the recent past from the American government accusing uh, Sheikh Hasina's government of uh, rigging elections, authoritarianism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and this is uh, we can see this, you know, in a very partial manner. Uh, on the on one hand, you have Pakistan, where this complete military controlling the system, democracy is in shambles. But Americans are not uh, you know, putting any blame on Pakistan. But uh, when it comes to Bangladesh, they are sanctioning their officials, and you know, they're just. Uh, moral policing them it's it seems like a continuous interference something which we also felt in india's case so i want to know more this you know uh, the play of uh, chinese role and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the american role what are the interests at stake and uh, i mean why would the americans do it and uh, and if we ask another question why would chinese want to do it i mean what are they going to get out of it i would uh, infer or calculate that the Chinese aren't overly thrilled with what has happened. Uh, the blame China lobby in India is a American sponsored lobby, which is very dominant. And which uh, jumps to that conclusion, irrespective of uh, reality. If you recall when, uh, when Sheikh Hasina in uh, revealed in uh, May earlier this year that uh, she had received a white man's offer to uh, for a clean uh, for, for an easy election provided she consented to a, to an air base for them then china too uh, was uh, was fully in support of sheikh hasina and lauded her refusal so uh, and you know anything if bangladesh is considered uh, if a hostile Bangladesh is hostile for India and it counts because of its proximity, then the proximity uh, was a wee China is also not so far uh, removed. It's like the missiles in, uh, in Nepal. Uh, they point both ways. Uh, they may be intended to point at China, but they, uh, it's just a programming uh, detail. They are equidistant with India. So, uh so also 
So I don't think China is really in going to be very happy with what has happened yesterday. And China, China, India, and the US, we may not be as big players as the other two. But all three of us have continually engaged in trying to play off the other two against each other. You know, th that seems to have been the modicum over the last 30, 40 years of foreign policy. It's uh, all negative pol uh, policy agendas invariably come with a price. We are all, all, uh, all three are paying for it. Thank you. Uh, this is yeah. uh, this is far more a Western move, far more a petroleum move. Also, uh, another issue which Sheikh Hasina revealed in May was uh, that the Americans wanted to sell Bangladeshi oil and gas to India. They wanted to become the uh, intermediaries in selling Bangladeshi. Uh, gas and oil to India, and the market they, int they intended was India, which she turned down. So, uh, we must remember all these and uh, when we calculate what has actually happened. Uh, thank you very much, Namitji. You mentioned about the 1971 war, and you said that this is this looks like some kind of a repetition of what uh, happened in the immediate uh, past of 1971. I want to know that did we face a similar situation post 1971? Definitely, India won the war. Indraji and our security forces played a human's role in that. But uh, when it comes to this deep sea drilling in the Indian Ocean, why didn't we start this deep sea drilling uh, in that region, the Bengal region, despite winning the war? I mean, if we had done that, our economy would have prospered. Our dependence on the Gulf states, you know, would have minimized, and uh, India would have been an absolute economic giant. So what ultimately, you know, prevented us from doing that? That, that, that was the biggest uh, payoff, the biggest following the, the, the war. You see, in the war, we managed to hold off the American fleet and the British fleet. Today, declassified documents uh, even detail the uh, the commander of the Eagle, the British uh, aircraft carrier in the Arabian Sea, uh, his communications to the commander of the uh, Enterprise, admitting that they were too late and uh, uh, that uh, he was surrounded by ships all around and he could not join. The, as far as the Enterprise is concerned, two, Brit uh, two Soviet uh, nuclear powered submarines overtook the uh, enterprise, the entire American carrier group was encircled. And therefore, uh, and because of this encirclement, it could not make its way to Dhaka and Chittagong. And despite Kissinger's repeated orders to engage with the Indian Army in Dhaka, uh, and the Jessore sector especially, they, uh, the, uh, the enterprise could not uh, make headway. Recently declassified communications uh, of the Russian uh, submarine commander uh, clearly reveal of how they, uh, because they had only 300 kilometer range uh, anti ship missiles. So, how they uh, first uh, overtook the enterprise and then they positioned themselves uh, in between uh, Chittagong and uh, because the Indian fleet, Eastern fleet could not get in. The Indian Eastern Fleet was blocked off by the American fleet. It was the Russian nuclear subs which uh, uh, overtook them. And then uh, they, uh, the, with their uh, missiles pointing at the Enterprise, to let the Enterprise know that there was no headway possible, these subs surfaced, and then again, again submerged. All, the, all this has been recently declassified. So the American narrative is entirely false. The war was won on military and naval tactical terms. The, uh, the problems uh, after the war came from, uh, you see, uh, 
we talk of uh, of the seventh fleet being involved in the uh, in trying to signal to India to lay off, which we did. Which Indira Gandhi still went ahead and uh, ordered. Um, uh, in fact, there was a race in time between after two, uh, the Russians had uh, shot down two American moves uh, in the Security Council. And there was a third American move uh, for a ceasefire building up. And to preempt that, we had to get a document of surrender, which Kissinger wasn't allowing the Pakistanis to offer, despite the fact that they were obviously beaten. So uh, we have uh, now the memoirs of uh, Lieutenant General um, Jacobs, who went to collect it uh, from uh, Niazi before uh, he formally surrendered before uh, Jagjit Singh Rora. And, and those details give out not, uh, they give out the military aspect, but the Pakistanis surrendered. And they surrendered publicly in a stadium, not even privately. Those were the Indian terms. So after that, the Americans had no leg to renege on that. But then the American fleet remained in, uh, in the Bay of Bengal. The Soviets also did. And uh, they remained there for almost a year or more. And uh, the reason why, like we referred to this episode as the seventh fleet's entry into the Bay of Bengal, the Western papers generally refer to this as Task Force 74. The uh, Task Force 74 has a special significance. It is an Anglo American uh, task force dating back to uh, the Second World War and which was revived in uh, 1971 for the first time after in the Indian Ocean after the um, uh, Second World War. Now, in Britain, there was a lot of uh, debate inside the cabinet. The prime minister of the day uh, was, uh, uh, who was the prime minister of the day? Uh, the gentleman who, the Bilderberger prime minister, who, uh, uh, it'll come back to me in a minute. But anyway, so he and his, uh, security establishment wanted to participate in the war. But the rest uh, of the cabinet was not with him. And Queen Elizabeth was also reportedly very unhappy with the possibility of an engagement with India. But uh, with American pressure and the then head of the MI6, the SIS, uh, Sir John Rennie, he was a critical actor who uh, persuaded the British government to send in the uh, aircraft carrier Eagle and uh, some commandos. And later he became the interface for all the uh, unspeakable terms that the Americans had to communicate. And those uh, terms were communicated by uh, Sir John Rennie to T.N. Paul, who was then foreign secretary. And the, uh, he did not communicate it to his uh, intelligence counterpart in India at the time, uh, though he had some uh, lines of communication to him, but he preferred to communicate it through T.N. Call, who was considered very close to the prime minister and uh, with whom uh, Sir John Rennie had uh, a prior relationship uh, during his uh, foreign office days. So, um, and those terms were American terms, not so much British terms, but they required that India should not engage in deep sea drilling. And that it would be seen as a, uh, as a direct threat to American uh, sovereignty. Now, how come Bay of Bengal waters becomes a direct threat to American sovereignty. But that is what the US Navy is about. The US Navy invariably defined themselves as, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they, they define themselves, especially their carrier fleets, in terms of 
acreage, the the size of the of the entire fleet, the surface area. They say that, that acreage is defined as American sovereign territory in international waters, and the tonnage is uh, in Kissinger done gunboat diplomacy style is referred to as so many tons of diplomacy. This is how Kissinger defined the equation. And that is what uh, the seventh fleet was doing here. The British eventually withdrew their aircraft carrier, but Sir John Remy, Rennie became the, uh, the man who communicated to the Indians that uh, deep sea oil drilling would be seen as a direct threat to American sovereignty and uh, there would be uh, some fallout. That is the reason why for 53 years, we have not uh, pursued this agenda. But now that the petroleum scene has changed, the crude oil scene has changed, and Saudi Arabia has led that change by refusing to renew the petrodollar agreement of uh, 1974. And uh, with Russian oil, wherein we are, in any case, uh, we have held our own against uh, the, so the American sanctions, which have no legal bearing on us. So uh, this was a logical next step that finally we tap our own resources. We have known for 50 years or more that uh, the Bay of Bengal is one of the biggest hydrocarbon reserves in the world. But we have been spending billions of dollars worth in importing uh, crude. Last year, I think we imported $120 billion worth. The previous year, we imported $144 billion worth. So, I mean, if we finally, uh, yeah, if we finally add, replace, yes, yeah, sorry. Come. Uh, as a small caveat to what you just mentioned about the deep sea drilling, uh, I want to know that the prospects of India initiating deep sea drilling in the, the Bay of Bengal region in 1970s, were they real or, I mean, it was just something uh, in the pipeline? Because the question that arises here is that did we have the right kind of technology to do deep sea drilling in 19, 1970s or 80s? You see, the example would have been North Sea oil. And if uh, so, but, but those, uh, that technology was not available to us because the point man who was communicating the message was... Uh, if the point man was the head of the SIS, then obviously that technology was not available to us. And the West did have uh, that technological lead. Their ability to, uh, and you know, uh, this is uh, one, and anybody who would have, any third party who would have, a, uh, who would have, uh, with whom we would have had a technology sharing agreement must factor in the possibility of uh, of sabotage. So that must have deterred a lot of people. That is why in every field we have been forced to develop everything ab initio, as we have done largely in space and uh, nuclear technologies and in computers. Now, we, we actually have seen such a sabotage happen in 1989. Uh, the Rajiv Gandhi government brought in what was perhaps the most ambitious uh, overhaul of the Indian economy ever till date, when it brought in uh, software and hardware, computer technologies to jump, you know, to jump into the next orbit along with the rest of the world and have a level playing field. And in the 80s, uh, we had uh, uh, the level of technology available to us was uh, largely similar once the the PC revolution began. We were building PCs with our own indigenous chips, the 8084 and all those uh, chips which uh, marked the beginning of the PC revolution. Then in 1989, the, the price of, of, uh, of the entire Bofors fracas, which was unleashed, which eventually turned out to be bogus, though no government has bothered to admit it because the opposition parties of, the, of that time would find it embarrassing to do so today. But uh, the price of the VP Singh government was that Semiconductors India Limited was burnt to the ground, an act of arson. And 
the evaluation was that 100 crore rupees was adequate to rebuild it. But uh, uh, the VP Singh government never uh, consented to it. And after the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi, we have largely had uh, American dominance inside our government systems. And so uh, it was never allowed to be rebuilt until it became outdated. It's only in this century after 1989 that there was an attempt to restart it. And now we are hearing of chip manufacturing uh, in, uh, uh, by the Tatas in collaboration with uh, the Taiwan company. The Taiwan company was far behind technologically speaking in 1989 compared to SCIL. So similar kind of risks you have, you see, uh, there is inadequate appreciation in our country about the role of economic of economic warfare and the uh, and the uh, and what is called american uh, gunboat diplomacy as they call it is all after all wars have to have a reason there has to be a benefit uh, to uh, to engineer a war and uh, the primary benefit is economic dominance thank you Thank you. Now, coming, uh, moving uh, beyond the economics, uh, I'll just get into uh, the other domain, which is becoming, which is very problematic for India. Uh, since yesterday, we are getting reports that Jamaat e Islami has already attacked 250 Hindu temples and you know, the incidents of rape, arson, killings are rampant in Bangladesh. Jamaat e Islami is an organization which is very radical extremist following Maulana Maududi's ideology. They have deep rooted ties with the ISI, Pakistan. In the 1971 war, they were supporting Pakistan. In Jammu and Kashmir, Jamaat e Islami has been the main engine of terrorism. So now, with this military back in power and Jamaat elements and the BNP back in power, it seems that the minorities are going to face tough time in Bangladesh. And even in the West Bengal, the situation is really bad because it, we see that over the last uh, several, a few decades, you know, the Islamic extremism in West Bengal has uh, you know, grown by leaps and bounds. Demography has changed in several districts. There's this, you know, continuous uh, illegal migration of Bangladeshis and Rohingyas into West Bengal. Those little small enclaves of LAT have, have come in several uh, smaller areas. I don't remember the exact names, but I've written them in my various articles. So how do you look at that? I mean, with this government in power, this military regime with the Jamaat-e-Islami, uh, do you think that the anti-India terrorist groups, uh, the, the northeastern ones, as well as the Islamic extremist groups, you know, you know will find safe havens in Bangladesh? And uh, what, how will it, it's going to impact the situation in West Bengal? The Jamaat leader was present well, along with the general yesterday when they made their announcements about the interim government coming in. That itself was a big enough indicator. Then we know that Tariq was uh, and the BNP uh, worked out the details sir, of. Uh, uh, sorry, am I? Please mute yourself. Uh, I'll request you to mute yourself. Please mute yourself. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Varma, please carry on. Thank you. Now, we have reports of uh, prior meetings of. Uh, the Jamaat and the BNP in London in the month preceding this event yesterday. Uh, so obviously, uh, and of their interface with uh, their American handlers. Now, given all this, uh, we know that there is a script waiting to be authored. And I understand that just now the it has been uh, that uh, Mr. Yunus, who is uh, very closely connected with the American State Department, has agreed to become the chief advisor or chief mentor of the interim government. I believe this uh, news flash came in about an hour or so ago. So uh, that the Americans are moving in is there. We have to wait and watch whether their demand for an for a air base in Bangladesh goes through. Now, Sheikh Hasina in May made uh, various uh, issues she raised. She let out three things in particular. One, the demand for an air base for a 
easy election, but she didn't need the help. She turned it down. The second was uh, that she mentioned that uh, there is an attempt to create a new Christian country by taking out pieces of Bangladesh, Myanmar, and northeastern India. Uh, these, this statement of uh, Sheikh Hasina was, uh, was uh, again, uh, it found some resonance in Prime Minister Modi's uh, uh, speech in Parliament, where he finally revealed these threats vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Manipur problem. Now, so, uh, and you have to, and as I had have earlier outlined, how the Russian uh, submarine interface had denied Kissinger the ability to engage militarily with the Indian armed forces. That, it is that, uh, you know, that is the, the fulcrum of the requirement for an air base in Bangladesh. The Americans like to sell everything as their preparedness against China, hoping that uh, all of us will be uh, dumb enough to buy that. But it, it uh, you know, it's, uh, as I said earlier, everything that points at China is equidistant with India. Thank you. Thank you. Now, coming to the last part of this interview. Uh, now it seems that uh, definitely, I mean, we have a problem in Bangladesh. You know, your Pakistan's deep-rooted interference, backed by the Americans and all those jamaat e islami actors. You know, so definitely, this is going to be a problematic spot for us. With Pakistan, we already see that there is a renewed emphasis on terrorism and extremism in Jammu and Kashmir and various other parts of India. With China, we have a very you know, tough border situation right now. The talks are not progressing and there is some kind of a very cold status quo that's a stalemate so with that i mean can we conclude that india is now faced with uh, not 2.5 but a 3.54 front 3.5 front and See, how should india the, navigate that situation on the surface it would appear like that it is uh, i think it is uh, there's also a fair amount of intransigence in the way our foreign policy is being conducted today that uh, there is almost a delight in uh, engaging with China uh, in a very, uh, you know, on uh, on these issues, and we are being, and our foreign policy establishment is being played by the Western establishment to fall out with China. We have far bigger synergies possible with China compared to our conflicts, and. A proper sit down would uh, uh, could possibly uh, solve these issues very easily, but as I said earlier, for the last fifty years almost, we the India China United States triangle has been a game of each. And I'm not saying that only the Americans are doing it or only the Chinese are doing it. All three of uh, these countries have been busy trying to play the other two off. And uh, it's a negative game which is going on. China really doesn't have any economic conflict for us, with us. Because uh, we are more important to them as a market. And we are the most important market globally. So China, uh, Will, uh, will only be shooting itself in the foot by, uh, you know, really, uh, if it were to uh, block its way into India. The territorial disputes are being, uh, these trigger happy territorial disputes are similarly being egged on by American proponents inside the Chinese government. And the fear and the Chinese fear of India joining an American alliance against them, be it the Quad, be it uh, whatever, or you know, like uh, India allowing um, uh, its uh, 
airspace and its uh, uh, overland um, transport to American uh, cruise missiles traveling to Nepal. Thank now, these, these issues are uh, have just been glossed over by the Indian security establishment. But uh, everybody is aware of what is happening. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks and comments and analysis of this uh, critical issue which has unfolded in our neighborhood. So now it's time to wrap up today's discussion. But before that, we can take two questions. And I can see Mr. Atul Aneja has raised a hand. He has a question. Uh, so over to you, Mr. Aneja, please ask a question. You need to un unmute yourself, Mr. Aneja. You are on mute. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Abhinav. Uh, outstanding uh, discussion. Uh, I just have a small uh, observation question. In fact, uh, we see the American influence, and I completely agree with uh, Mr. Verma on this. Uh, they have re-established after they were ousted from Afghanistan. They got back into Pakistan through Nawaz Sharif and and Co. and probably Asim Munir. Uh, definitely as with the, with the Pakistani military. And now you have them coming into Bangladesh with this regime change, which has taken place. I think the first in South Asia, we have seen it in other geographies, but I think South Asia, this is the first one which has taken place. Uh, what are India's options? Uh, do we, uh, do we uh, open out an outreach to, to China at this time? Because I think at the, at, I completely agree with you that Perhaps China and India are both victims of this regime change, which has taken place in, in Bangladesh. What do we do with the Russians uh, at, at this time? Uh, what do we do with the BRICS? What, what options do we have to move more closer towards Eurasia uh, and not the Indo-Pacific uh, to counter the negative currents which are coming from Bangladesh, which perhaps if Pakistan and Bangladesh are gone, is India also on the radar? Of the of those who want to on this regime change, uh, in 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 this polarized context, in a multipolar world, what what options do we really have? That's a lot of questions, but uh, I'll take them one by one. You see, when when Bangladesh was created in 1971, we talk of it by and large as. Uh, uh, in terms of Pakistan being divided. That is the South Asian narrative. There is another aspect to it. When that happened, the it was a balkanization of one of the CENTCOM partners. So much as you would today imagine an attack by Russia on a NATO country, the 1971, despite all the genocide, the Americans expected that if Pakistan is a CENTCOM pillar, then you then nobody else has the, has any business uh, challenging that. Kissinger and Nixon didn't want to acknowledge, even though their own man in Dhaka was uh, the blood report is uh, now out as a book, the uh, the blood telegram or whatever. Okay. But uh, yeah, you're right. So uh, now that, uh, but they had all the feed and they ignored the genocide of 3 million people, more than uh, the genocide of uh, even the Jews during the Second World War. So that is the first thing. It was, it was seen as an assault against an American military command. And at that point of time, the American Middle Eastern arms strategy had uh, four pillars. They would talk of four pillars, Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Pakistan. Now, uh, this was the first assault. Eventually, Iran would fall out as well. So, uh, the, the, uh, it is only hereafter that the Americans uh, then became active in uh, Afghanistan. 
to uh, counterbalance their ability, like Bangladesh provided uh, an access to Indian and Chinese frontiers, Afghanistan did something similar. In addition to the warm water route theories and all those other blocking the Russians and all those theories, those apart. So this is the first, uh, uh, yeah. then when you come to options, your next question about options or what uh, we should, whether some kind of synergy with China can be developed, God willing, yes, provided our present establishment is, uh, I think the political establishment is, uh, is on board to uh, to evaluate uh, possible setups. It is the security establishment and uh, the foreign policy establishment, which are too America centric to uh, allow a meaningful discourse with China. Why it has been reduced to this status is a is something that we all need to evaluate again. What we can, how we can uh, engage with Russia. Russia has problems enough of its own at this point of time. So uh, it would not really be feasible to expect the kind of help we got in 71 today. Britain is certainly, you know, Britain, though in 1971, uh, it joined, but it were, but its uh, entire actions under American pressure seemed to be hesitant and it reflected uh, serious doubts inside their establishment. And uh, as I said, the, the interlocutor was, uh, Edward Heath was the prime minister whose name I couldn't recall earlier. And Edward Heath was a committed builder uh, entirely with the American administration. And uh, Sir John Rainey again was committed to the Americans and eventually he had a very ignominious uh, end. He had to resign after his family was found uh, involved in heroin uh, smuggling. For the head of the SIS, nothing could be more ignominious. Uh, but these are, this is the kind of interplay which has gone along. And we, no doubt, uh, the government of India of the day had a role in bringing out all these uh, things, and uh, Edward Heath had to uh, had to go. He the he lost his party's uh, internal parliamentary uh, lead by barely three or four votes, if I remember the story right. But uh, uh, there was enough pressure on him from the Indian side of revelations of what of his role in. 1971, which uh, would have made him absolutely unacceptable to the British public, and therefore he did not even contest again when there was a recontest. He was offered, since the margin was so small, uh, he was offered a recontest, but uh, he didn't take it. He retired from active uh, administrative politics. He remained in Parliament for several years. He became, I think, possibly one of the uh, for a period, he even chaired the Bilderberger group. But uh, so uh, there is, there's a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of undertones which the Indian establishment of the day was involved in. And it was this environment which actually led to the declaration of emergency. This was the foreign hand that Mrs. Gandhi used to talk about and uh, the opposition used to joke about. But the kind of messages that uh, Sir John Rennie was communicating to TN Call at that point of time was nothing short of blackmail and intimidation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Namichi. Uh, we have one quick question, and this is the final question from uh, Mr. Rahul Tanwani. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Abhinav, and thank you so much, sir, for a great session. There are two perspectives here which further come into play that I think further investigations are required into. If you remember sometime last year or last to last year, BRICS had made a proposal of an alternate currency. And as emerging economies, that alternate currency would have been a direct threat 
to the dollar and as countries are being expanded in BRICS, it becomes a threat to American hegemony. Secondly, by positioning itself in the Bay of Bengal, America then has a larger chance of probably being a threat of controlling the SARC for what it could have been and should have been, and also lands up countering the BRICS association which is there. Could you probably give an insight into this and draw a lateral connection if possible? See, I'll take your questions in uh, two uh, uh, parts. First is the monetary angle. And next, the, uh, the regional uh, interventions, the regional grouping interventions. Now, far as the monetary angle, you see this, the monetary angle goes back again to Nixon and Kissinger. In 1971, 15th of August, America, uh, I went back on its uh, commitment, uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement. The Bretton Woods Agreement did not require America to uh, shore up the gold standard. The Bretton Woods, the Bretton Woods uh, required that all member countries would subscribe to their quotas of gold, and that would provide the ballast for the world currency, the SDR. Since many member countries defaulted, America offered that it would provide the gold uh, required to uh, for the world currency but it wouldn't do it directly it would uh, the american dollar would remain convertible in gold and the sdr could be uh, uh, the dollar would have a have a fixed parity with the sdr so on the face of it on day one they said that the sdr would remain the world currency but if Everybody knows that the SDR's dollar parity is coming through the dollar, that the SDR is not uh, convertible, but the dollar is convertible. Then the world would gravitate towards the dollar. That is how the dollar became the effective reserve currency till 71. And then on the 15th of August, when the United Kingdom presented a check uh, for conversion to gold to the United States, they defaulted and announced that they were, that the dollar was going off gold. So after that, all of a sudden, uh, the American economy started facing the heat of uh, a lot of capital flight. To solve this, we have first uh, Kissinger's interface with Faisal, which, didn't, which uh, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, which didn't go too well, and Faisal virtually ordered him off. That how, uh, then uh, following that, uh, between 71 and 74, you have the 1973 Yom Kippur War uh, between Israel and uh, Egypt and Syria. The Saudis didn't get involved, but all of uh, the Middle East was uh, on high alert, and the Saudis didn't have the weapons. And then Kissinger uh, came up with the New Deal that, uh, okay, we'll arm you, provided you... Uh, accept the petrodollar, that all oil sales will be dollar denominated. And uh, that agreement has continued uh, till now, uh, 50 years, from 1974 to 2024. And on the 9th of, uh, of June, MBS uh, said he was not renewing it. So that was the first river, the first uh, formal reverse, of course, the Americans must have known of this for some time, but that was the primary reverse, which has now happened and is one of the impetuses for what is happening today in Bangladesh. As you mentioned, two years ago, the BRICS currency. The, but the BRICS currency saw a falling out largely because of uh, uh, the India-China uh, inability to go along together on currency issues. And India has uh, gone along more with the ADB, where it finds uh, more traction with Japan, where China has been kind of uh, contained. And therefore, China's need to have its own uh, uh, banking uh, consortiums with other countries. But this, uh, the inability to solve these uh, rough patches has seen 
that the BRICS challenge has not taken off. However, vis-a-vis -vis new cryptocurrency uh, currency, uh, interventions, we saw China and uh, we saw new, uh, new uh, alignments emerge where China, South Africa, Israel, and uh, even Thailand, I think, was one of the original few who joined together uh, in these experiments. India also has been an observer. The Americans were kept out till eventually uh, only the Federal Reserve of New York, not the entire treasury of the, uh, the treasury is represented through this one single federal reserve, not by the overall uh, uh, Fed. So, uh, they have recently joined in. So, all the, uh, these new configurations are happening, but if any of these configurations happens, and the dollar supremacy is wiped out, then all those sectors who are dependent on the dollar supremacy, which we loosely refer to as the deep state of America. Now, uh, they believe that they are in, uh, it is their entitlement and that entitlement is being hurt. So, uh, and they are willing to go to any extent. The, uh, we have recently heard of uh, how they perceive that Trump challenge, Trump is a threat to them. And we've heard of the role of Blackstone in the Trump assassination or speculation thereof. And we've heard of uh, private financing from such people to finance the procurement or the uh, or the turning of of mercenary armies from the Russian camp to the Ukrainian camp. How the Wagners were paid off three hundred and fifty million dollars as an advance, and things like that. So. Uh, the last one month has there has been a hectic uh, movement from all these forces who is happening possibly because of the uh, initially because of the threat that uh, the Biden administration was about to end. Now, of course, Kamala Harris is uh, making a is establishing a lead over Trump. So maybe uh, maybe that will make them slow their pace. Otherwise, they were probably trying to position the American government in such a, uh, in, in a, in a pincer uh, situation where it would no, have no options irrespective of the party change to, con uh, to at least allow some of their agendas to continue. So this was, this explains also to some extent your secondary questions on the on the SEO and the SARC and uh, BRICS. Now, uh, SARC is largely, in terms of security alliance, SARC is a failure. Let's not, there's no point uh, uh, having any. Uh, and uh, the SEO is not, a theory, is not a forum where India has a security, uh, Privacy. So, the SEO can, at best, be a, 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 com a, a commerce-related uh, alliance. BRICS again is largely the BRICS is uh, has a, has flavors of everything, but it is a little disparate uh, geographically. It is a disparate grouping. What we need is for the since we find that the commercial uh, interests tend to bring us together, it is necessary for this commerce to weigh over the security uh, framework. Only then will it be effective. We should try, because there can be a lot of synergy between India and China. If that is understood by both parties properly, then uh, the security issues can at least be put into cold storage if they can't be made to disappear. But uh, 
some kind of a solution would then be possible. After all, China and Russia have had very contentious issues which they have overcome to develop the kind of uh, relationship they have. So that you have to understand the Chinese mindset. And uh, you see, there is a problem with our uh, foreign policy establishment that we have, the problem with India is that uh, every time we see an empowerment, the empowerment tends to become hostile to the old elite. And that is not the way a country can work. The whole basis of having a bicameral system of parliament was intended to keep the old elite and the newly empowered populace both in sync and both to, and to get together, both of them to work together. That is not happening. The newly empowered want, uh, uh, they want their pound of flesh, their Shylock's pound of flesh straight from the heart of the old elite. And that it will eventually kill India. So uh, we, we have to sort out issues at home and we have to sort out issues with people elsewhere. And uh, only then will things uh, work out. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Nalak you. I, uh, I wish we had more time, but we are running short of time. So we cannot take any more questions, but definitely the discussion was absolutely enlightening. And uh, we learned a lot from your thoughtful analysis. We'll invite you in the near future for some other event. Thank you very much for joining. And thanks all thanks the a lot. participants thank you, who joined us today. Thank, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you.